Been? Okay, here we go. Let's get started. And a very warm welcome to our 83rd Security Thought Leadership webinar. And we've been here every Tuesday and Thursday uh, at this time, although stand by for a variation next week, uh, examining a topic of central importance to the security world. And the idea of thought leadership is that we critique today what's going on in order that we get a better type of security tomorrow. And the idea of thought leadership is to do that critique. And to achieve that, we invite an expert panel who've got experience in the subjects that we are, have got on offer. And today, we're gonna to be talking about events, uh, security shows and exhibitions. Uh, how will they evolve in 2021? On the one hand, we've been getting used in some form or other to the virtual. What does that tell us about what's coming when security events go physical? Um, and how will that affect the way that physical events are held? And when will they be held? And will these shows survive in their current form? And all these are gonna be discussed by our panel. Each of them is an expert in exhibitions and shows, each of them running security shows, each of them running shows that attract an international audience. So what I'm gonna do in a second is I invite each of my panelists to introduce themselves. And once they've all done that, all three of them have done that, I'll then come back to them for their opening statements. Three minutes where they get the chance to say what they want about this subject matter. And then I'll come to you, the audience, for questions. If I could invite you, please, to use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions. Get your questions in early, and I'll endeavor to include it in the discussion that follows. So without further ado, let's go and meet our panel. And let's ask Rachel, first and foremost, could you introduce yourself, please, Rachel? Okay. Hi, thank you, Martin. Hi, I'm Rachel Shattuck. I am Group Event Director at 19 Group. I'm responsible for International Security Expo, and that's due to take place in September at Olympia in London, and also the new launch International Cyber Expo. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Michelle, could you introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Martin. My name is Michiel Gen. I'm a director of European projects for ASAS International and a partner at Exempla, uh, an association and events consultancy based in Brussels, and I'm part of the team that's uh, producing the ASAS Europe event. Thank you very much indeed. And finally, George. Thanks, Martin. Hi, I'm George Pearson. I'm Regional Director uh, for West Africa at Montgomery Group. Um, we organise the Securex um, Africa portfolio and I look after the Securex West Africa exhibition. Thank you very much, indeed, George. Well, look, what an expert panel. You think they're going to know a bit about uh, where we're going with shows and exhibitions. So let's see what they've got to say about it. Three minutes, starting with Rachel, your opening statement, please. Firstly, thank you, Martin, for inviting me on. It's absolutely great to be here today to, to get to talk about uh, like the world of security exhibitions. So firstly, when we look at really what we're going through today, I think we need to bear in mind from the research I've done, exhibitions have been around for over 800 years. Um, and even in the last 100 years, you know, despite two world wars, despite a number of uh, global health crises such as the Spanish flu, they've thrived and they've survived, you know? So I think it's fair to say that exhibitions aren't going in away anytime soon. But that said, I think we need to acknowledge that the world is very much a different place to what it was pre-2020. So much has happened. And as the, world new, as the world adapts to like a new normal, I think so must the exhibitions industry. I think, unfortunately for us, the guys that work within this industry, um, you know, this virus is spread by human contact. So it's inevitable that the exhibition industry is one of the hardest impacted industries globally. Um, and who would have thought that in our time, it would have been illegal to run an exhibition in this country? I mean, it's just unbelievable. But I truly, truly believe that exhibitions and the human interaction that they bring are deeply embedded into businesses' psyches. I think there is a desire to reconnect and for, uh, to meet with industry colleagues, and that is just unbelievably uh, powerful. And in the same way last night I was uh, looking to book a summer holiday, I think there is real pent-up desire to be back to business as usual. I think within the end, exhibitions industry itself, I believe that the security sector is one of the most resilient um, and it's as important today, if not more so than it was uh, a year ago. Um, at 19 Group, uh, we haven't run an event in over a year 
And that's afforded us a little bit of a luxury of uh, time uh, to look at the way things have evolved and strategize about the future of exhibitions. Um, and I think at 19 Group, we fundamentally believe uh, that um, digital will um, play a, a future part of our physical events. We can see the tangible benefits of digital. I think it can be on demand, it can be consumed 24 seven, it can appeal to wider audiences across uh, greater distances. And for us as organizers, it can help us cut our costs. You know, we can put on a very, very valuable uh, content program by bringing in remote speakers um, with less impact on our budget and also less impact on high level uh, speakers diaries. But I think putting all those positives to one side, uh, I think it's clear that there's one thing this year has taught us, particularly the last month, a Zoom Christmas is no replacement to real Christmas. And for anybody that's homeschooling at the moment, which I myself am homeschooling, a Zoom classroom is no replacement for the real classroom. And I think just to summarize it, I think as it stands today, no one can say exactly what's going to happen in the future. And um, there's just still much, still so much still to play out uh, with the vaccine rollout. I think there will be uh, when we actually do get the green light, the go ahead to, to open, I think there will be congestion in the calendar. Um, however, I do believe that that uh, will settle down into the normal rhythm very quickly towards the end of 2022, 2023. But what I do know is that there will be a place for the digital element within the next phase of exhibition evolution. Rachel, thank you very much indeed. Plenty of us to come back on there. Don't forget, if you want to pick up Rachel anything, question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Get your questions in early and I'll endeavour to incorporate it. Uh, Michelle, your opening statement, please. Yeah, uh, Martin, yeah, thank you. Um, no, I think the, the event sector has escaped digitalization for a very long time. And, and, and 2020 may, in hindsight, be seen as a kind of a Napster moment uh, uh, for the events industry. Uh, Iata and Bill Gates give their rather dire predictions about the return to normal business travel, which leads me to think that online events are, are here to stay. Even when on-site events return, the future is going to be hybrid. Uh, there's a lot of innovation going on in, in virtual event design, and the technology that provides the infrastructure behind online events is keeping up. Many things that were not possible only a few months ago are possible now. Talking about conferences, for organizers, it's it's critical to adapt conference formats to to the online envir environment to better suit the the experience. Nobody wants to sit in front of a computer screen for two to three days straight. Uh, and online events also require a fundamental rethink of the value proposition to sponsors and exhibitors. The traditional trade show model of selling real estate square meters to exhibitors uh, does not work in such an environment. Uh, I think online events offer very clear advantages and Rachel touched on those as well. They, they offer freedom from time constraints. Uh, content can be, can be consumed uh, on demand. Uh, they offer freedom from physical space limitations. So you don't are not limited to the numbers of rooms you have. You can cater to niche interests in your event. So you can, you can uh, uh, basically uh, enlarge your, your audience that way. They're highly attainable because the costs are much lower and people don't need to travel. Uh, they are data rich uh, because everything that happens online can be measured and that is something that can be monetized as well. Uh, they're facing big challenges as well. Uh, uh, and the biggest one is recreating those chance encounters that you have on a trade show floor or in a coffee break. In the events world, we call that serendipity and that's the most difficult to recreate, but it's not impossible if it's carefully designed in. Um, event design is a major challenge. You cannot just copy paste an on-site event, events to an online environment. Um, you see many virtual event platforms that try to mimic a, a, a physical venue. We call this skeomorphism. That's a term I only learned last year. And this should really stop because it, it, it just uses valuable screen space and it's a depressing reminder of the fact that you're not on site. Uh, sponsor value requires a complete rethink. Uh, and many events offer mainly brand visibility, uh, and that's just not enough to, to justify a major investment. We think about engagement. Uh, sponsorship should be built around the ability to generate leads, that underpins it all, the, the ability to have face to face meetings, thought leadership, data and insights, and brand awareness. Uh, and, and the nice thing about having a brand in an online environment is that it can have an actionable outcome. I don't think on-site events will disappear, but they will certainly change. 
uh, and I think the future is going to, going to be hybrid. Thank you very much indeed, Michelle. Well, I wonder whether George agrees. Just before we come to George, just to say to you that uh, don't forget question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. If you get your question early, we'll build it into the discussion. Um, George, your opening statement, please. Thank you, Martin, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, I think for me, I'm just looking ahead uh, in the near future, uh, and I think certainly uh, we can be more optimistic going into 2021 than we have been in, in 2020. Um, saying that, you know, I don't see a, a significant return to large scale physical events, um, certainly for for the next few months and probably the few next few quarters. Um, that being said, you know there is some positive signs out there. Um, if you see Dubai, for example, I think they're about to start a number of their larger uh, international events from, from February onwards. Um, but I think what we'll see is a, a regional and phased uh, return to, to physical events um, as government uh, vaccination pro, uh, programs start taking effect and the use of rapid testing and, of course, the social distancing uh, measures. Uh, and that coupled with virtual and hybrid options, you know, we are seeing large scale events coming back on, hopefully in the next sort of six months or so. Um, you know, that being said, though, you know, the situation is still quite fast moving. And just to give you an example, uh, for SecureX West Africa, uh, which I look after towards the end of last year, we were starting, you know, the situation on the ground there was, you know, a lot more stable and um, um, the, the exhibitor uh, confident was coming back. But in the space of about six weeks, you know, they've now gone into another, uh, into their second wave and, you know, running physical events already for the next six months is looking pretty difficult. Um, I think one of the biggest barriers that um, we're going to face as global exhibition organisers is the travel restrictions. And even with the COVID situation starting to stabilise, you know, throughout 2021, um, travel restrictions in particular, quarantine, are, are going to be in place. And you know, I think these are going to be huge challenges for us, um, particularly for international exhibitors, um, you know, who want to travel. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of what our new normal is, and it's, it's such, I'm sure we're going to talk on it quite a bit in this discussion, but it's, it's the hybrid, it's the integrated model, which will allow um, exhibitions to continue, but, you know, to be able to bring in their domestic um, visitors and domestic uh, exhibitors, and then give the option for international uh, exhibitors to either attend in person, <coughs> excuse me, or um, attend uh, virtually. So, um, but I would say overwhelmingly from our community, you know, the, the, the feedback is that uh, people want exhibitions back. And I think we will bounce back very quickly uh, as and when we can. And, our, you know, for our companies to come back and start um, communicating again with their community as, as they emerge from the pandemic. Thank you, George. Appreciate it. OK, very, very good. OK, questions flowing in. Uh, let's go to, straight to, to Rachel. And Noah Price is picking up on this issue of this combination of virtual and physical, Rachel. Now, um, it's an easy thing to say, but when I go to a physical event, how am I going to benefit from virtual? Some virtual presentation from somewhere else? Because I could get that online. Am I really going to be attracted to that, Rachel? And uh, um, uh, likewise, uh, uh, where does that leave exhibitors that can't be there? Surely. This hybrid is a bit of a is a bit of a bit of a difficult one to make happen meaningfully. Rachel, then then Michelle. No, I absolutely. I you know both um, panelists have have touched on this. I don't think you know what you get from a physical exhibition. The networking, the meeting peers to peers in the uh, in the aisles is very different difficult to recreate uh, virtually. However, the hybrid model will allow remote international speakers, remote international visitors to come. And uh, George is very much right. There are, even if the UK has rolled out their uh, vaccination program, uh, one of the first in the world to roll out, there will be many countries still um, under travel restrictions, even if the UK opens up. So absolutely, um, that hybrid, it will be essential to bring the international audience in. Um, there will be benefits. You can then um, bring in the remote speakers, as I said. What we found 
around, we've recently run a virtual event and we got a lot more senior level, high level speakers because it's less impact on their diary. If you're asking somebody to fly over from America, you're looking at a three day diary window minimum, yet virtually you're asking them for a two hour uh, to give up two hours of their diary. So I think there really are key benefits um, and you can see it within conferences and theatre content, but also within like live demonstrators or, uh, you know, some of the features could be like put out uh, in digitally as well. Okay, I mean, Michelle, let's come to you on this because uh, I get the point you can have speakers from overseas, but what about exhibitors and what about sponsors? It's far from obvious to me that that's a good option digitally. We should. Well, Martin, perhaps first I could I could I could get into the question of of what hybrid events uh, uh, can be to to uh, to offer value to both on site and online attendees because I think that's a very important question and there are new models out there that can do that. Uh, hybrid doesn't necessarily mean that you live stream what's happening uh, on site to an online environment. You can detach it. Uh, it's it's and that way uh, uh, all attendees can benefit from the value that's offered, uh, um, and from the organizer's perspective, it's is much easier uh, to to deliver because you don't have uh, such it's not as heavy on the on the staff requirements uh, as as it is to to deliver simultaneously. Okay, okay, so so got that. Fair enough. What about, what about exhibitors and sponsors? So you see, the thing is, Michelle, I get the point that this can work for bringing in live demonstration, I, people from all over the world, I get that. But what about the experience for exhibitors and sponsors? Because ultimately, 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 they pay their salary, they pay the wages. Yeah, again, uh, simultaneous is, is difficult, although it can be done. Uh, if you think, for example, uh, an exhibitor might have a smaller booth, uh, but then you have an, an online presence that becomes a kind of a, a traffic driver to that to that booth. It's it's we're we're more looking into the detached model than the simultaneous model, uh, uh, and I think there there are, there are tremendous benefits that can be brought to to sponsor and exhibitors there. But we have to let go of the traditional concept of a virtual booth uh, and de-emphasize that and really look at lead generation face-to-face -face meetings, positioning as, as thought leaders, so credible but sponsored content, uh, providing data and insights to the exhibitors, and that, uh, 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 of course, has to be done in conformity with all uh, applicable privacy laws, um, and looking at, at brand awareness that actually, uh, and branding that actually brings value to, to those exhibitors. Okay, let me ask you the same question, George, because it builds on uh, um, something that uh, Noah Price has asked about. How can we... How confident are you this hybrid is going to be good for business in terms of sponsors and exhibitors? But I think with the hybrid model, you know, there is no one size that fits all. And, and certainly, you know, from my experience working in the West African region, it's a very different, they're very different uh, model to what perhaps you're working with in the UK. Um, you know, we've looked at the hybrid model uh, and actually felt that we can, well, we prefer to call it actually an integrated model because there's certain parts that you can bring in, certain parts that you can't, you know, depending on which region you're working in. Um, but we kind of see from a, a hybrid model, um, it, it's more from the conference side. We're not necessarily, necessarily seeing the virtual exhibition booth being a viable option for us moving forward. However, we are seeing from, and I think Rachel said that in, in her answer, you know, from a conference perspective, it's very, it's very different for an exhibitor to come and travel for a week to an exhibition, but to try and get speakers to come for one day or maybe half a day, it's a very different matter. And actually what we've seen, um, you know, before people might see that we're cutting corners, if you like, of um, providing um, speakers via video, but I think that's now become the norm. So we're very much looking to implement the, the hybrid conference model into our exhibitions, but probably not for our particular um, example, bringing in the virtual booth. Interesting. OK, so already we're seeing that there are different approaches emerging around the world. Uh, um, Rachel, a uh, question for you from um, Andy Powell. And it's about uh, um, uh, whether uh, uh, there's a there's, do, you, do you feel the international uh, uh, show and yours is one uh, um, can actually happen physically this year would be the first question. Uh, and the second question, I suppose, related to that is that, um, is there a, a, a potential that these are going to be regionalised going forward rather than these one big shows once a year? Is there a, is there a possibility that may change? And if so, 
you see it for the better. Rachel. I absolutely hope the International Security Expo and International Cyber Expo will go ahead uh, this year, but who knows, that is very much on the government and the, depending on the rollout of the vaccination, I think um, if, it, if, if we do get the go ahead, we will run a very COVID secure environment uh, and there's nobody better place than event organisers to get that up and running and do that. The international element of our event, um, could be an issue. You know, do I think our international audience will um, be maybe as high as previous years? No, probably not. But this is where the hybrid then comes in. This is where we can, um, you know, ISE, International Security Expert, is very, very content heavy. Uh, it's the high level content that we put together. We run over five conferences on site. So I believe that that is where we will do the hybrid, um, opening up access to our international audience and also our international speakers. We also, we often work with the DTI to bring in hosted buyers um, from international de and then international delegations, you know, there's models out there there you can do um, matchmaking and, um, so it's like on virtual environment in a virtual environment so absolutely I think the hybrid will play a part in ISC uh, in September. Okay uh, uh, Michelle let me ask you that question but but uh, I suppose the question I suppose the question is that uh, um, yours is a bit sooner isn't it you've got a big event uh, um, earlier this year your expectations Yes, Martin. No, thanks. Uh, uh, no, the, the, my expectation is that, that in Q1, uh, events will clearly only take place online. Uh, but our events is, is, not, is, not a, is not a trade show. Uh, it's more of a summit uh, type, of, type of event. So we're hoping, of course, that depending on format, size, travel requirements, the speed of the vaccination rollout, at least some physical events may be possible in Europe sometime in Q2. Uh, of course, it's, it's unknown at this point what, what can be done. In Dubai, as, as George mentioned, they have, they have shown that, that, that it is possible to do something with distancing measures, etc. Uh, but yeah, at this point, we can, we can only hope that uh, uh, at some point in Q2, we can do something. We've built our events in a detached hybrid way. So what we're doing is trying to front load as much of our value through those, through those, um, through those online days. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and hopefully the, um, the, the physical meeting that we're planning to, uh, for Brussels uh, 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 on the 31st of May and the 1st of June can, uh, can take place uh, in, in some way or form. And just, uh, just out of interest, Michelle, I've got a question from Gottfried uh, Hendricks here, which let me put to you. And the question is about whether you'd be anticipating that people are going to have to show proof of having had a vaccination. Um, or, a, or a relatively recent negative test in order to be able to attend. Is that sort of a, is that on the agenda? This is something that, uh, that the EU is currently looking at. Uh, Greece has proposed uh, a European vaccination passport. Uh, I think it would be great for the event sector if we can have something like this Europe-wide. Uh, uh, and with Europe, I hope that the UK will be uh, included in that as well. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, George, uh, um, let me ask you this. Uh, just a bit on that uh, uh, vaccination, uh, that passport. Is that going to um, affect you? Because yours is in June, isn't it? Your, your big event, your Securex event in West Africa. Um, would it, do you feel that that's a route to getting people back? And uh, um, how likely is it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we've got uh, Secure X West Africa. We normally run it in March. We made a decision last year to move it to June, hoping at that time, you know, at that stage, we were going to be more and out of the water. And clearly, you know, we're not quite there yet. Um, yeah, from a vaccination perspective, I mean, we've, we've talked about it internally and, you know, the, the risks we've got to look at or the, the challenges we're looking at is, you know, will our international exhibitors attend is one and, and will local audience attend? And, you know, I think being realistic um, for Nigeria to have any um, reasonable um, uh, vaccination program by by June is, is not going to be possible. But I think, you know, one thing we have considered is that our international exhibitors may have had their vaccinations by then. Um, but I think, you know, we're still going to be in a position where there'll be a quarantine measure in place in Nigeria for some time to come. So I think that's sort of our, our biggest threat, if you like, um, rather than it being the vaccine. Yeah, fair enough. OK, let's go to Rachel. Rachel, a question from a couple of, uh, um, of the audience, uh, Dennis Shep and uh, Mike McBride, a case in point. And they're both sort of um, addressing this social aspect of it. The, 
the serendipity meeting people by chance bit. And uh, I know that, and I'll come to Michelle afterwards, I know that this is a, a biggie, isn't it? The, the one thing you don't get when you've got this online, which you do get, is that bumping into people yeah. in the cafe, in the, by the yeah. booth and uh, um, um, going in and out in the How do you get that? That is the bit that you can't re recreate. And that is why face-to-face -face exhibitions and conferences are as successful as they are, because it is that chance encounters, it is the networking, because business is all about networking as well. And it's catching up with colleagues and peers. And, and so virtually, it's very, very rare that I've seen that interaction. I mean, you've got the virtual events. We chose as a business for 19 Group not to pivot the business to virtual um, events. You know, we had many demonstrations with the little avatar people going around shaking it. With, you know, it just doesn't work. But we have embraced digital and we've run, a, you know, a studio set up, um, International Security Week. We've run a number of webinars. There is a, a place, but that is why I think there is a desire to get back to face to face. You know, we're seeing exhibitors booking in at a rate that you know, it has even surprised us because people want to be back to, uh, to do business. It's for the small SME market. There was a, an article in The Economist the other week saying, we're one of the worst hit uh, industries, but we will be one of the most resilient and quickest to bounce back because I think there is that need for face-to-face. -face. You've only got to spend all day on Zoom to realize it's not a natural thing for a human being. If you deprive us as proper interaction, food and water, they're the three things we need. And I think that is why I have no doubt that um, once we get the green light to open, you know, we will be successful and the comeback will be quick. Uh, Michelle, you, you appear to disagree with uh, Rachel because you said in your opening statement there were ways in which uh, uh, you could replicate that experience. Let's, yes, yes, I think, your I, think, I think there are. And, and I must say, in the past year, I've attended a lot of events, that uh, online events uh, across the world that I would otherwise never have been able to attend. And I have, I have made loads of contacts through those events that, that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to have. Uh, we think through careful event design, you can recreate serendipity. Uh, and there, there are various ways to do that through networking functions, through themed uh, uh, roundtable discussions, through uh, uh, a workshop type of, type of meetings that you can do it. It requires active participation from participants. You cannot sit back. Uh, uh, you have to, you have to it, it requires an adaptation of the mindset to be willing to make those connections in an online environment. But I certainly do think it's, uh, it's possible uh, because I've, I've experienced it myself. Yes, I know. Yeah, I've, I've done a few of these uh, networking. They, it, as you say, it takes a little, it takes a separate mindset, doesn't it, to, to, to get into it. But, but you're right, it's got, it's got a role. Okay. Okay, let me, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question now because uh, Adrian Becker's got a question, which is, is, a, is a question from my own heart here because I, as you will know, I regularly give talks around the world. And Adrian's question is, the problem for speakers delivering virtual presentations is they can be a soulless experience um, for the presenter, that is. Uh, no meaningful feedback and audience uh, interaction. And, you know, the other thing is, if you're the type of speaker who doesn't speak from slides and reacts to the audience, um, um, because that's a better way of entertaining, a better way of communicating. This going online bit takes away the opportunity to do that. Uh, um, George, is there a way, uh, since uh, all three of you have advocated the possibility of having people from outside speak, uh, George, you first, then I'll come to Rachel. Um, is there a way of getting around that one? Uh, it's a tough one. I mean, I'm still, you know, it's, I think in Rachel's camp there in terms of, I, I don't know you can replicate, you know, face-to-face -face, um, the environment from face-to-face -face exhibitions. Uh, I think certainly, you know, there are certain thought leadership like this that works very well online, but I still think to gain the same environment, uh, you need to be, um, you need to be in a face-to-face -face environment. But I do think, you know, what we will see is, is with the mixture uh, and perhaps what you'll have with conferences is you might have the moderator that is in person uh, and then have one or two speakers that may be there in person and then others um, video calling in and I think that way you can uh, re recreate what you've got from a fully face-to-face -face exhibition but uh, or conference but I'm, I'm not sure you can recreate that uh, purely from a, a virtual but that's, that's my opinion. Well, presumably Rachel disagrees because she's been advocating it. Rachel, what do you think? 
Well, I'd just say adding on that, we ran a, a virtual event at International Security Week, Week and it was exactly as George described. It was a mixture of some remote speakers, a moderator in a studio with some live speakers in the studio. And that did work well. Um, but I, I, I truly believe there is something special in face to face. It's what I went back to in my point over a Zoom Christmas. Many of us had to have the Zoom Christmas with the grandparents. With you cannot get that ultimate fit. Yes, we connected. Yes, it was nice. But it's not the same as physically having a handshake, saying, do you want a quiet word, bumping into somebody. It, you know, it's it's not, it's not. It's too scripted and too formulaic, I think, to just give the spontaneity that um, you get with a, with a live event. It's the spontaneity that's missing. Yeah, actually, it is an interesting point. Simon Chang says, uh, I've yet to attend a virtual event of any worth. Uh, Michelle, do you sympathise with Simon Chan or do you think you've just not been going to the right events? I think, uh, and I, I hear these kind of comments a lot, that people people's view of online events has been clouded by poor experiences in the past. And, and we've been seeing a lot of innovation in, in, in virtual events in the, in the past months and year. Uh, uh, and I would I would invite him to give it give it another shot. Try for example, ACS Europe. I I would <laughs> I would just say on Rachel? I think the um, the level of content that you can get the value of the content in virtual events is often you know higher level because you can bring in experts on with less diary time and so you they are more inclined to give up that time because it is a smaller uh, uh, time so I think often it, it is and I know I've attended more events virtually than I would in person because again it, it's less less time so th there are value in both. Yeah I mean one of the things Michael Gibbs, Michael Gibbs was actually on the, uh, the panel on Tuesday when we were talking about ESRM and there's been on a, a couple of panels before um, it does feel, though, that, uh, um, I mean, there's been some advances in technology, and I think, uh, um, Michelle, you, you've made this point, but it does feel as though that, okay, they've made a bit of an advance in terms of it being better than it was, but it's hardly been persuasive, Michelle. It's hardly sucked everyone in to the point is all of you are saying there's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity there to go, to go virtual. What you're all saying is, at best, we'll integrate it to some extent. I just wonder whether virtuals failed in some ways in that in that sense, Michelle. Well, it's 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 an evolution, and it, and it's and it's the, the technology was not in place. The platforms didn't support a lot of the value that 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 you would get from a, an on-site event, and people were expecting that in a way. Uh, uh, but now that the platforms are back up to speed and, and have adapted and have innovated. There are a lot more ways in place to build an integrated event experience online. Um, so so I, I would I would really recommend people not to not to give up on the uh, on the online model because because there, there's there's uh, there's there's a lot happening there. Do you do you sense though that Michelle that it is going to get better still? I mean do you sense that uh, we're on a, a trajectory here which is uh, Gonna, we're going to we're going to in due course where it's going to be unraveled there are better ways of doing this i think so and i think we're working on one uh, for for the acs europe event that uh, that really tries to bring all these event pillars uh, 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 in, in in an online environment uh, um, uh, and, and try to bring a lot of the same value uh, that you would get from that from attending that online event. Now, of course, it's going to be different, and of course, it's not going to be the same immersive experience. And of course, you you, you don't share uh, a drink, a virtual drink, is very different from uh, from that. So it it does require the will to make the most of the situation. Uh, uh, but but then again, there are clear advantages uh, uh, to it because if you if you look at the 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 free the the, the, the the, the freedom that you now have from time constraints is that you can create an event that doesn't doesn't last two or three days, but the event that we create is basically four months. So people can come back there, they can network, they can connect, they can consume content, they can connect with, with the sponsors and exhibitors there. Uh, a lot of the content once delivered becomes on-demand content. Uh, the content that we deliver live is going to be a very heavy focus on interaction and debate uh, 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 and not a one-way type of traffic. Uh, so that's, that, that's, uh, that's just an idea of what, we, what, we, what, we, what we're working on. 
Yeah, okay, sounds uh, sounds quite dynamic. George, I mean, um, one of the issues that uh, uh, you have is you organize, you mean people organize their events in different parts of the world here. Uh, yours is in Africa, George. And uh, um, uh, the situation in, in, in Nigeria, of course, as you were saying in your talk, is quite unstable, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, um, they're, they're suffering immeasurably at the moment. Uh, not all African countries are, but, but Nigeria is at, at the time. Uh, um, are, you, are you geared up for the fact that it might not happen in June physically, George? And are you geared up for the fact that some form of, what did you call it, integrated model is possible in June? Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and we have got some plans in place. I mean, our desire and our hope is that we can run this event, uh, event face to face. Uh, and we just need to see how the situation pans out over the next couple of months. But, you know, we, we're already looking and we have been running um, a series of, of webinars for, for all of our events in Africa. And they have been very successful. And, I, you know, I'm, I, I think in terms of connecting with the community, you know, throughout the year, uh, this has had a silver lining effect for that. Um, but for instance, if we aren't able to run our events in June, we will look at having, uh, whether it's purely more webinar based and online conference, we will have an alternative there. Um, but we just need to wait and see, see how the situation pans out. Yeah, I mean, uh, we did, we did run uh, the Nigerian uh, uh, Oscars online actually this year, we had a fantastic mm. turnout. So uh, obviously um, it, it is doable. Uh, let me come uh, uh, back to, to Rachel. And I've got a question here, Rachel, uh, about insurance. Now, um, along the early, early days, this was a, a really big, uh, a really big issue actually, were we going to be able to get, in, uh, get insurance for the shows? Is that, is that a problem now, Rachel? Um... <laughs> Yes and no. We are insured as a show. Um, it's just costing a, a substantial amount more uh, to cover pandemics than it was previously. But um, you know, we we are completely uh, covered. But, yeah, uh, but it's not it's not so costly though. It's undermining the ability to hold a physical event because no, it wasn't the start of COVID. You couldn't get insured. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, and so we've managed that. What you said to George before that, are we prepared to roll forward? We absolutely hope we don't have to roll forward the exhibitions. But at 19 Group, we have another uh, event within our security portfolio, the security event, and that's now rolled forward three times. So you, you said to George, are you prepared? We absolutely are. If needs must, we will go forward. But we've been very lucky to have the exist exhibitor support role with us on every occasion that we've had to roll our events forward. That's very positive. That's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's because the exhibitors just want that lead generation. They want to be back meeting with their customers and they want that face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, I, I yeah, Michelle, let me just ask. Well. Sorry, Carol, George, yeah, Carol, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to second that as well. I think the one thing we've seen out of this, uh, we've also had to roll many of our exhibitions and every time, you know, the vast majority of our exhibitors have stuck with us. We've offered them the refund option um, on all occasions, but nearly, you know, out of all, most occasions, our exhibitors have stuck with us. Uh, and I think, you know, Rachel's right. They just want to get back to face-to-face -to -face interaction. So, so we've, uh, yeah, that's been quite a positive sign from all of us. Let me just come to Michelle and say, but Michelle, to Andy Blackwell's question about insurance and the exhibitors rolling forward, has that been your experience? Um, with the exhibitors rolling forward, we, 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 have, we see a lot uh, of our traditional uh, exhibitors, but of course we're not a trade show, we're, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a conference, a learning based event, so it's so more difficult to compare, I think. We see a lot of our, our supporting uh, companies, uh, our sponsors, uh, rolling over with us, uh, and we see some new ones as well now. Okay, I, I mean, because one of the points about this, and uh, in, in many ways all three of you have answered this, but I suppose when I put this together, one of the reasons I put the uh, webinar together, if I'm being honest, is I was concerned that they, if they might not be commercially viable, um, and that the companies would sort of struggle in this environment. And, uh, you know, there's no shows and exhibitors aren't paying to be there and punters aren't paying to attend in quite the same way, whether they whether it's still commercially viable events. Uh, Rachel, I asked you that question, but in the context that in the, in the last quarter of this year, I expect there are going to be a lot of shows maybe from September onwards. It's going to be a crowded space. Is there a danger that um, security shows are going to face a problem then that there are just too many? 
I think you're absolutely right. And like, I will celebrate the day that um, we are in that crowded atmosphere where we are running shows and there are many, many um, exhibitions. I think what you've always got to say is, you know, if they survived uh, before, they'll survive again in the fact that it's to do with the audiences. Yes, the manufacturers and suppliers might have a very uh, busy couple of calendar months, but the events themselves are bringing uniquely different audiences. We've got the two security events and at the moment um, within the 19 group, and they're both positioned in September, either end of September, but we're running two security events with one within one month. Is that ideal? No, but geographically, one's London, one's Birmingham, they're uniquely different audiences. So I absolutely think um, it will be fine. It will be congested. And I think that natural rhythm, give it a year, end of 2022, 23, we will go back to the norm. And we'll find that spring and autumn, still congested, they always are. But um, we're very lucky. We've got strong financial backing from uh, Phoenix Group at 19. We're an independent like young business so we're agile so we can pivot our business and uh, amend it accordingly to how we need to shift the show and um, so no we're very excited and you know we hope that the competitors come back we hope they're strong because that leads to a, a bigger better stronger industry I, I think the other thing is though Rachel you actually go first don't you so tell me you're one of the earlier we're going to go to the, your show the security early. event uh, is running 7th to the 9th in Birmingham and then my event International Security Expo is 28th 29th of September but we've also got other shows yes. got DSEI we've got uh, Millipol we've got uh, Counter Expo you know there's lots of us but what a day the champagne will be open that day we all open our doors because it's been a long time coming yeah, I mean, Michelle, I'm going to ask you this question because you're in a slightly good position. You haven't got a big event, at least in security in September, not, not the one that you run, I suppose. Do you feel we're going to be crowded out in September, October, November? I would say in normal circumstances when events are, uh, are can attract global audiences, which which I think is maybe still in doubt for, 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 for this year, um, it, it will have less, less of an effect. Uh, um, um, there, there may be some global travel, but I, I would say these big events are going to be primarily regional or even national. Uh, so so I, I don't, other than the disruption that is already there, I, won't, I don't see a huge impact there of the crowd space. But it is, it is true, I think, that, that there are far too many security events in, uh, around, and it, it might be good to have some consolidation there. Wow, interesting, interesting. Okay, uh, thank you so much indeed, Pam. Let me ask you one final question each. Slightly doing uh, justice to the sort of input from Helen Stiles and Tyler Green Pope, who've been asking questions which I couldn't quite address. But let me come back for your final comment uh, um, on, on this. Uh, um, as we move forward, I'd like to know what do you think will be the main influence on future events from this period of COVID-19? What are we going to be doing different? What's the headline bits that are going to be different going forwards? Uh, I'm going to ask you 15 seconds each. Uh, Rachel first. Um, what I think it is the hybrid model. I absolutely think we will embrace digital. Uh, it will become a component key part of our physical events, but the physical element will still be as important as ever. It will just add a certain value to our physical events. It will not replace them. Thank you very much indeed, Michelle. I fully agree with what uh, Rachel is saying. Uh, uh, big future for, for hybrid events. Ye yes, uh, uh, physical events will remain important. Uh, I think what you will see is that the different mediums will be used for the way they can con provide the, the biggest value to attendees and sponsors and exhibitors. Uh, so so, so, so that, that, that will be a change, I think. Okay, George, finally you. Yeah, well, I think certainly for the next 12 months, the hybrid models uh, will be used. Um, and then I think moving forward, there's a lot that we've learned over the last 12 months, which will then be integrated into uh, our exhibitions and conferences moving forward. But, you know, I do think that in, in a few years time, when we're back to hopefully a, a normal, normal life, um, you know, the physical face-to-face -face exhibitions will be the priority and, and it'll only be a, a, an element of the uh, hybrid model left. It will go back to physical exhibitions. Okay, thank you very much. Well, panel, thank you very much indeed. Absolutely fascinating debate, many issues raised, and we will return to these. 
I've got to be honest, uh, this might just be because I'm old, but I quite like the fact that all three panelists are telling me we're going to have physical events as we knew them before in key elements as we go forward. Um, thank you very much indeed. Just a few final points from me, if I might. Uh, just to say that uh, I've got to encourage you to register for the UK Ospers 2021. It's the 25th of February, 3.30 in the afternoon. I promise you, you will not have seen an award ceremony quite like this. So please do register. It's free online for the UK Ospers. Just remind those of you who are in uh, South Africa, and Nigeria. Entries are still open for the Ospers. They close in March. Start getting your entries ready. You haven't got much longer. And uh, um, there's a major research project going on on the impact of COVID-19 on security. We'd love to have your views. Please do give us your views um, in an online survey. We'd really appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, and just to say that we here, we're here every Tuesday and Thursday, as you know, normally at this time, but next week on Tuesday and Thursday, we're at a slightly earlier time. On Tuesday, our topic is the, the state sector in Russia. Security in Russia. What's been going on there? There's a hidden little gem. Three panelists from Russia are going to be give us their insights on Russian security. It should be fascinating. 11 a.m. on Tuesday, 11 a.m. UK time. And then on Thursday at 8 a.m. in the morning, we're going out about Southeast Asia. What the normal looks like, the new normal looks like there. Building on a webinar we held last year. Um, it's at 8 a.m. because, of course, it's much later in the East. Uh, the week after, managing the, the health of frontline workers, mental health of frontline workers, and the role of GSOCs. That's the week after. So plenty more coming up. Great, uh, uh, great panelists coming up. Thank you very much indeed to you for your time today. Thank you very much indeed to the, to the panel for their insightful insights. Absolutely fantastic. Don't forget, a copy of this uh, webinar will be on the website tomorrow, along with a blog that I will write. Thank you to Christine Brooks and Hannah Miller in the background. Uh, hopefully see you next Tuesday, 11 a.m., the webinar on Russia, wherever you are in the world. Until we see you again, stay safe.